Give it up for Pedro and Napoleon Dynamite and Gage. So if Pedro's coming, you can come too, all right? So don't miss out the movies. It's an awesome time. Uh, many of you don't know uh, what that is, or it sounds kind of weird. Um, it's fun. You don't want to miss it. Popcorn's delicious, and there's free cold Cokes um, and Diet Cokes and waters if you want to be that person. That's up to you because we have a moment where we all open our Cokes together, and it's the best. While we do at the movies, to be honest with you, is just to open those Cokes together. And uh, so we have, we have a great, great time. I usually don't do this, but I just want to know, how many of you at the movies was your first week here? Okay, there's quite a few of y'all, uh, some in the sound booth. Uh, many, many, many people tell me that. It's like, man, our first week was at the movies, or we caught the Christmas edition. And so normally we do three weeks in November and then the first week of December. The way the Sundays fall this year, we're going to do it the entire month of November. And so invite somebody with you. We have cards to give away, so they're all over the place. They're on tables out in the common area. has all the times and dates and everything with it. Uh, so, so take one of those with you and invite somebody. Tell them about it and bring them with you. And it's great for people who don't normally come to church um, because it feels a little less churchy. And, uh, man, you're sitting there eating popcorn, lights are out, TV's going, you know, the subs are hitting you in the gut. It's, it's just good stuff, okay? And so we got some amazing movies, um, and so they're gonna, it's going to be powerful. I hope you'll bring somebody with you because um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to give you a little more information because that is coming up. There's some other things coming up I want to share with you. October the 27th, we're celebrating 12 years of WRC. Come on, that's exciting. 12 years. And so we'll have a little special snack, and uh, it'll, it'll be fun. So come, come that week, bring somebody with you. Water baptism will be that week. Uh, we're, because of the movies, we're going to actually move water baptism one week sooner, and so it'll actually be the, the last week of the month. Uh, November, of course, the whole month is at the movies. And December 24th, just so you can put it on the calendar, I know we're already talking about Christmas. Uh, I may or may not have a couple of Christmas trees up in my house right now. <laughs> I went to Life Group and came back, and a Christmas village exploded in my bedroom. But that's all right. Um, apparently, now the thing is to put a tree in every room. And so that's what we're doing now, apparently. Um, my wife is, is like uh, Macaulay Cuckland off of, um, what's his name, uh, Home Alone. Uh, because if I lose her in a store, I just look for the big Christmas tree. And that's where she's going to be, and that's where I find her. But we'll do, we'll do Christmas candlelight December 24th. We'll have our Christmas service on the 22nd. And just so you can put that on your calendar, we normally do it around 4 p.m. So you have time to come, uh, 4 or 5. We'll figure that out and let you know. But we, you'll have time to come and get to your family stuff. Um, and so that's exciting. One more update I want to give you. I did send an email out this week. I want to make this brief, but I do want to update everybody. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did a, an offering to print some books. My dad has a yellow book. So if you haven't gotten one, grab one at Next Steps. It may be empty on the counter, but that's okay. Somebody just took the last one. We got more underneath the counter, so don't worry about taking the last one. Take it. We got plenty. Uh, so we have this book. It's been out for um, about 21 years now. I'm sorry, about 20 years. Um, and so it's been translated in many, many languages, over 40 languages. Uh, we, we raised some money to get some printed in India. Uh, we have an amazing connection with a ministry over there called Evangelism Resources. They're here locally, but they, I'm saying local, they're in the United States. They're in Erlanger, Kentucky but they have trained people in India how to be missionaries so they don't have to keep sending people. They train them locally how to do it. And so they continue to get books printed. So we raised the money. I just want to give you an update for this Araya translation. We raised enough. We were trying to raise $8,000. You guys gave over $20,000. Come on, give yourself a hand clap right there for your, for your generosity. So, uh, so we got those done. And then he called the other day and he said, look, I need, a little, I, I need some more in Hindi. And so we, get, we got 10,000 being printed right now. We just sent the check off, along with 2,000 in French being printed in Rwanda, Africa. So, so you are touching the globe. And so I just want to say thank you, just, just let you know about that. It's a, it's a powerful thing to, to see what God's doing through and in that ministry. And so you're a part of that. So we thank you for that. A, a, a percentage of everything that comes into WRC goes to my dad's ministry. Uh, and so it's, it's a way that we continue to support his ministry because this church was born of his ministry. And so it's, it's, a, um, it's a great thing to do. And again, if you haven't read this book, I challenge you to read it. Uh, it, it, will, it will knock your socks off. I've had so many people call and say, uh, man, there is just, there's no fat. It's all meat. And so this is like, uh, this is a filet mignon, okay? That's what this is. And so I don't know if you like it medium or however you like it, but it's, 
So good. So I hope you'll read that. Uh, it's just straight to the point. Chapter four is a world changer, literally like global changer, uh, uh, galactic changer. It's so good. So, so I hope you'll, you'll read it, especially just if you have to jump to chapter four, do that. But it's only like 40 pages, so you can read the whole thing. But it's, it's just so good. So hope that you'll do that. I want to update you on those few things because that's, um, I just want to let you know what you're, what you're doing, okay? It's global. Um, because I don't think we have a lot of time left. I, I really do believe this. Uh, this series started with me answering one question about end times because that's what you guys want to talk about through the series, asking for a friend. And what was supposed to be one overview has turned into a three-week mini-series. And so that's what we're doing today is we're going to do week two of that. Uh, what we talked about last, uh, last week was we started talking about the festivals. And we talked about that because Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 and 2 say this. It says, this is, a, this is God's command. Now, now, Israel is, they left Egypt, and so he's created some festivals to help them remember what happened. But also, I'll show you this, it was also to look ahead what was going to happen. So he says, as the Lord spoke to Moses, this is what he said. He said, speak to the children of Israel and tell them the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be a holy convocations. These are my feasts. Now, that word for convocations, we don't use that a whole lot. What it means is it means an assembly or a dress rehearsal. So, so he says, these feasts that we're going to do, these feasts that I'm going to show you, they're a dress rehearsal for what's going to come. Um, and, and I'm going to tell you, it's going to blow your mind uh, how accurate, I mean, it shouldn't, but it will blow your mind how accurate the, the word was, even in Exodus and looking forward all the way to the, to the, to the four Gospels. So we're talking about thousands of years difference and the, 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 the holy convocations, the, the dress rehearsals were looking ahead to what was going to come. And so there are seven feasts or seven festivals that the, the Israelites, that they actually celebrate to this day. Uh, and they do it based on the lunar and the solar uh, cycles. And so depending on when there's going to be a certain moon, that's when they started. And so, so it's not like our calendar. But he actually, I, I shared with you last week, God said, look, we're restarting the calendar to today because I got you out of Egypt. You're about to leave Egypt into the promised land. So I want you to start your entire civil calendar over. So they have two calendars. They have a civil calendar and they have a religious calendar. So, so these dates were falling on certain dates, and they were in March and April, and then again in September and October. Just depends on the cycle, right? So, so they were all different dates. But we're seeing some things happen because we're in that season, they're beginning their religious cycle now, which is why it's important. But let me show you these seven festivals and what they represent. This is interesting. There's seven, there's four spring and, and three fall. The Passover we talked about last week, it represents the crucifixion. It reminds us of the crucifixion. And so the Passover, if you remember, they took the blood and put it over the doorpost. And anybody that had the blood, the, the, the death angel would pass over and not touch them. And if they didn't have the blood, the firstborn would die. So that was what happened in Egypt. And so it reminds us of Jesus' blood that was shed at the crucifixion. The unleavened bread feast is the burial. Now, here's what's interesting. 2,000 years later, Jesus was crucified at the feast of Passover. That day, the day that they celebrated, they've been celebrating it for 2,000 years. The day they started celebrating, in that time frame, Jesus was crucified during the Passover. Jesus was buried during the, the, the feast or the, the um, holy convocation of the unleavened bread. So there was a burial in the unleavened bread during that time frame. During the dates of the first fruits was during the resurrection. Y'all, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, God is all over this. For 2,000 years, they've been celebrating it, and they didn't even know that they were getting ready for the Savior to come to the earth. They didn't even know it. They were celebrating. They didn't even know it. They didn't even know that that's what they were doing, but that's what they were getting ready for. And then the, the fourth one is the day of Pentecost. Uh, and then the last three, we're going to talk about these next week, but the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And so, so why am I telling you all this? Why does this matter? Because I believe that God is showing us that the end times are here. I believe that he's, he's telling that to us. Now, does that mean that you go out and sell all of your stuff and, and give all your money to the church and, and go figure out something else? How to, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that we have to look at the signs of the times, and I believe that they're on us. And so we're going to talk this morning just for a few minutes about these other three feasts, two, three, and four. The first one is the unleavened bread feast. And the unleavened bread feast, there was unleavened bread. Um, if you go back and read the Exodus, they didn't have time to let the bread rise because they had to get out of Egypt quickly. Now, there's, there's another thought, and that is that, that leaven or yeast represents sin, and so they didn't have any in their bread because it represented purity. So the unleavened bread feast reminds us of the purity of Jesus. Listen, if Jesus would have died on that cross with sin in his life, we would try to earn our way to heaven. Jesus died a perfect death because he lived a perfect life. 
And so this represents, this shows us that Jesus died in purity. It, was, it reminds us of the purity of Jesus. In fact, if you go back to Exodus, he gives some specifics about this feast. And y'all, they're pretty, they're almost frightening. Look at this. Exodus 12, 15, the first half says, For seven days of bread you shall not be made with yeast. On the first day of the festival, remove every trace of yeast from your homes. Like you got to go through your kitchen, through your cupboard. You got to pull the stove out. You got to get the little, what's the little, uh, little small mini vacuum? The dust buster. Uh, like you got to get the vacuum, the, 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 the rainbow vacuum out. Like you have to get, you can't even have a trace of yeast in your house. And, and look at what he says. Uh, look, look what happens if you do have. Anyone who does, who eats the bread made with yeast during the seven days of the festival will be cut off from the community of Israel. He took it very, listen, let me tell you, God takes sin very serious. He continues to take sin very serious. Now, sadly, we, we don't have the fear of the Lord that we used to, but he still, he still sees sin the same. Sin is what put his son on the cross. Sin is what's going to send you to hell if you don't believe in Jesus because you live a life of a sinner. Now, when you receive him, are you still going to sin? Yes, but you have his blood that's covered you. When you put the, door on the, the blood on the doorpost, does it mean those families were perfect? It means they were covered by the blood. And when you say yes to Jesus, that's what you get too. But listen, they took it very, very serious. They were cut off from the community if they, had even, uh, if, even if they ate just a little bit of yeast in their bread. That's interesting. They took it very serious. It represents the purity of Jesus, and we should strive to live that, that life. And I don't mean to try to be perfect. And I don't mean to, 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 to live a life that we're, we're almost in prison by trying to do everything exactly right. I'm saying that we should honor God with our bodies and with our life and with our attitude and with our words and with the songs that we listen to and the places that we go and the things that we eat. We should honor God. He took it very serious. You will be cut off from the community of Israel during this feast if you ate anything with yeast in it. Here's the third, the third festival, the second one that we're going to talk about today. Um, this third festival is a festival that's, uh, that's very important, obviously. This festival happened. Now, Jesus was crucified during the Passover. He was buried during the unleavened bread feast, and then he was resurrected during the first fruits feast. Yeah, you know what the odds are for them to celebrate for 2,000 years these certain things and then Jesus came and died and was buried and resurrected on those dates of the year? Well, yeah, it is 100%, but, but the real odds are crazy. I'm talking for there to be one, one prophecy to be fulfilled that the Bible wrote about is almost, the, I, we can't even fathom the number, the odds, because it's so, it's so, you would not go to Vegas with these odds, let me tell you. You just wouldn't. You wouldn't go to the, you wouldn't. It's, it's so incredibly rare that these things happen on these dates and during these times. So they're celebrating the first fruits and Jesus rises from the dead. Here's what the first fruits reminds us of. The first fruits feast reminds us of the power of God. The 11 bread fe feast reminds us of the purity of Jesus because we're about getting the sin out of our life. Then, then this one reminds us of the power of God. Listen, when Jesus, God raised Jesus from the dead, we talk about that. You might just say that sentence, God raised Jesus from the dead. Do you know the power that that took? He raised Jesus from the dead. It's first fruits. Now, where do we get first fruits? Well, check this out. This is interesting. The Bible tells in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of all of those who have fallen asleep. He became the first fruits when? When he was risen from the dead. That's interesting. Why? Because it's all tied together. Listen, God doesn't just do random stuff that don't matter. When God does something, there's some, there's some order to it. And he created these feasts and these festivals and these convocations or these dress rehearsals. Listen, the Israelites for 2,000 years were getting ready for Jesus and they didn't even know it. That's how God works. You ever, you ever I'll tell you this, my story is when I surrendered to ministry, and started preaching, I can look back to this day and see all the jobs that I had. God was getting me ready for ministry. I didn't even know it. Uh, I was the most introverted introvert that you could ever be introverted. Mom, I was introverted. He had, ask Danny Morgan. He knew me when I was a teenager. Uh, he's still shocked that I'm standing up here. His eyes are big every single Sunday. I look out there, he's like, that's really, that Andy's up there? I was introverted. My first job, cashier. You know what you got to do to cashier? You got to talk to people. I can look all the way back to my 18-year-old self and see how God was using the jobs that I had, that he gave me, that he showed me, that he brought me to, as they were convocations, they were, they were dress rehearsals for what he was bringing me. Can, can anybody attest to that? Maybe the way that you, man, God just showed you something about your money, how to, how to save your money and, and do things like that, and all of a sudden you come into a, a time of famine. 
And now all of a sudden you're like, okay, now I can see why I went through these things because you're getting me ready for this. Now, don't waste your experiences in your life. Don't waste them. God has a dress rehearsal. You're going through some things, first of all, so that you can see better when you get out the other side, but also you can help other people when they're going through it. So listen, this is a dress rehearsal. So, so these odds are absolutely crazy. Now, this first fruit, this firstborn, this first fruit ties all the way back to Egypt. In fact, let me just show it to you on the screen because I think it's interesting. God took Egypt's firstborn. God offered us his firstborn, and then he asked us to give our first fruit. God took Egypt's firstborn because he wouldn't let him go. And then you fast forward to Jesus, and he offers us his firstborn. And so that's how we find uh, freedom uh, and, and security and, and salvation is because of Jesus. And then he, what does he ask of us? He asks us of our first fruits. Uh, go all the way back to Cain and Abel. Uh, some people are like, well, I don't know why God accepted one and not the other. If you look, you'll see it. It's real clear. The Bible says that Cain killed Abel because Abel brought the best of the best. Abel brought the first fruits. He, he got the first out. He's like, oh, this is the good stuff. I'm giving it to God. The Bible says that Cain just brought some stuff. You know what he did in our time? <laughs> There's a reason that we don't take food donations here anymore, because you guys be bringing the craziest stuff up here. You gl the gluten-free stuff that was nasty, y'all trying to bring it to the church to give to people. <laughs> the stuff that you won't eat. Well, God convicted me this week of that. I was helping somebody, and, and I was going down the bread aisle, and I was like, I can, I can get great value for this. I, uh, he, he, can, he can live with some great value. I grabbed the great value. I'm walking down the aisle, going to check out, and the Holy Spirit said, uh-uh, you wouldn't eat that. <laughs> Went and put it back. Got, me, got some wholesome, got some, got some of that orange stuff. Y'all, God wants... He wants your first fruits because he knows that when he gets your first fruits, he has your heart. That you ain't trying to keep it for yourself. Listen, this, this feast of first fruits is huge. Jesus has become the first fruits. God offered his first fruits, his first son, and then he asked us for ours. The first thing that comes out when, whenever we get paid is tithe. Just, just it's gone. Not gone, it's invested, right? We see that it's, it's, it's wasted, it's gone. No, it's invested. Wow, we're, we're giving our first fruits. We're giving the first fruits of our, of our attitude and our, and our energy. Give them your first fruits. Give them the first parts of your day. It's important for you to do that. The first fruits are so important. Um, and, and look, here, <clears throat> this power of that he raised him from the dead is so powerful. And look at what it says in Romans 8, 11. I love this verse. The spirit of God who raised God from the dead, from Jesus from the dead, lives in you. I can stop right there. We just go home on that right there. The, the same power that raised God from Jesus from the dead, lives in you, and just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Y'all, we're talking about a, a powerful moment where God reached down and raised his son from the dead that's been dead for three days and rolled the stone away, and he walked out. You know, I always wondered why Jesus walked out of the tomb when he walked through the walls and when he, when he showed back up to see the the disciples, he was walking through walls. If you don't believe me, go read the, the, the New Testament. You'll see it. You'll see Jesus walking through walls and appearing in rooms. Why in the world did he just walk out the tomb and just walk right through, just like a ghost, just walk right through the tomb? Here's why I believe it. He didn't roll the stone away for him to get out. He rolled the stone away to let us in, to let us see what happened, to let us see that he is alive and well, to let us see that there is grace, there is forgiveness, there is peace, there is mercy because of the first fruits, because the Spirit of God raised him from the dead, and now that Spirit lives in us. And that leads me to this other feast, the last feast I want to talk about today, and that is the Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost. So you have the Passover death, the first, the, the love and bread purity, uh, and then you have the resurrection, the first fruits, and now we have the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, which happened on, go figure, the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, it happened on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost happened on a day that they were always, always celebrating for 2,000 years, Pentecost. What are the odds? I don't know. 100% because God was all over it. But the real odds, I have no idea what they would be crazy. And, and this word for Pentecost is in interesting because it means 50, all right? Well, 50 don't mean a whole lot to us. I mean, uh, you know, it's a nice even number. But 50 was interesting to the Israelites because 50 was the year of Jubilee. Now, Jubilee was an interesting year because Jubilee was a year that everything just kind of, you just kind of got forgiven everything. 
Not just kind of, you did it. If you had debts, gone. That's why you go buy all the goats you could buy on the 49th year, okay? Go get that Ferrari, all that stuff on the 49th year. Because on, on the 50th year, it was Jubilee, and, and there, was a, there was a really a, a reset. And so, so I just I want to put it on the screen because I want you to see it for yourself. But Jubilee is a time of celebration and reset in the Hebrew Bible that occurs every 50 years after seven cycles of seven years each. Do you know when that's going to happen? It's going to start December the 24th of 25 and go through January the 6th of 26, the year of Jubilee, the year of the reset. Uh, you know what we used to do? We would play baseball or something. We'd be playing, uh, you know, if you're playing baseball and, and you know, you're swinging a miss and, and you just, the sun was in your eyes, you call a redo. You know, I was a big redo caller. I'd be like, oh, redo, redo. Wouldn't it be nice just to have, call a redo in your life? Now, I took that job. I should have took that job. Redo. Let me, just, let me just bust up in here like I already work here see what happens. It's a start over. It's a fresh start. The day of Pentecost was a fresh start. And here's what it reminds us of. The day of Pentecost, the feast of Pentecost, reminds us of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. It reminds us of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the purity of Jesus, and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. It's a fresh start. It's a redo. It's a do-over. You know what Christianity is in your life when you say yes to Jesus and surrender him? It's a, do, it's a do-over. Your life is jacked up and going in the wrong directions. You come up to him, you're getting a redo. You're getting a do-over. Mike's saying, God, I'm, I surrender my life to you. I, I can't do this on my own. It is a do-over. The day of Pentecost was so powerful. In fact, you see it in Acts chapter 2. We'll read a few verses from there. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And then watch what happens. They were all in one accord. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. So there was a feeling that happened with the day of Pentecost. There was a feeling that happened that, that the Holy Spirit showed up. And then, and then it, it gives more detail. I love this. It keeps giving detail. And then what looked like tongue, uh, flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on top of each of them. And I love this. Look at this. And everyone present, uh, that was present was filled with the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost was not just something they named it because it was a random thing to name it. They had been selling, celebrating Pentecost for thousands of years. And the Spirit fell on the day of the Feast of Pentecost. That's interesting to me. That's interesting to me that he fell on the day of Pentecost. The day had been a convocation, a holy convocation, a dress rehearsal for thousands of years. The Holy Spirit falls during the feast times, and he has poured out his spirit on us. We have to do something about it. I can't imagine getting to heaven one day and Paul just being excited about, man, how many people do you win to the Lord? Well, y'all had, had iPhones. You could message people. You could send texts to anybody in the world. How many people did you, how many people did you tell about Jesus? No, man, I was on Facebook. I had, I had other stuff to do. I, 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 didn't, I didn't have time. Job got busy. Kids running crazy. Y'all, God wants you to live your life, but we live our life looking around. Live your life looking at other people. Peter got it. Man, Peter, I shared this verse last week. I'm going to share it again. Peter got it. This was Peter's message a few, a few verses later. Peter replied to each of them, you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And people ask us this, they'll ask, man, when y'all baptize people, you say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and in Jesus' name. Yeah, because well, we're not religious about it. Because the Bible teaches both. Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the three things that I shared with you last week, I'm going to share with you again because they're super important. Repent. Turn to God and be baptized. Repent means to change your mind about your sin. It doesn't just mean to turn around. It means to change your mind about your sin. That's what repent means, to turn to God. So you're turning away from your sin, turning to God. And then he says, be baptized, those three things. You must be born again. There's an old evangelist that just, I mean, he went everywhere. His name was George Whitfield. And George Whitfield would preach, you must be born again. Every message, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must be born again. And finally, one of his buddies said, Pastor George, I, 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 don't, I know that you're saying this a lot, but why in the world do you keep saying you must be born again? And George Whitfield looked him right in his eyes and said, because, my brother, you must be born again. It's a message that never gets old. It's a message that we should never stop saying. Find Jesus, surrender him, repent, turn to God, and be baptized. That's the three steps.
Repent, change your mind about sin, turn to God, and be baptized. That's what he wants you to do. That's the steps that you can take. Are you ready for the end times? Are you ready for Jesus to come back? I'm ready. I ain't quite got to where I'm just looking up and not looking around, but I'm ready. I'm ready, and I hope that you're ready. I hope that you're ready. I hope that, that, that you're ready to surrender to him. If you haven't done that, do that. If you've already surrendered, you're like, man, I need to step it up. I got to step my game up. I think Jesus is coming soon. These convocations, these, these, uh, these dress rehearsals, they're getting, they're getting close. It's, it's happening. Next week, I'm going to share with you the, the, the last three feasts, which are fall feasts, and it starts with the rapture. We're going to talk about that next week. But God does things in order, and I hope that you're ready. I hope that your life is in chaos. If it is, bring it to him. He'll, he'll turn it into order. But you got to take that step. Take that step and watch what he does with your life.